Let's go to the book of uh, First Corinthians. I'm sorry, First Timothy. Uh, First Timothy, chapter number four. First Timothy, chapter number four, and verse number uh, six. First Timothy, chapter number four, and verse six. And uh, this scripture talks about, I love the book of Timothy, it's a lot of instructions there, and a lot of guidance for ministers, uh, for the brothers in Christ, to walk in the unity of the faith, and uh, guidelines of how we could be in the ministry, because we are all called children of the Most High God, and we are called into the ministry, every one of us are in ministry. We are We are able, New Testament ministers, according to 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6 says, we are all able ministers of the New Testament. We are all able, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So we thank God for His grace that each and every one of us are important in the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us are important in the kingdom of God. We are all members, in particular, in the body of Christ. All of us are called in for the work of the ministry. I need you, you need me, we all need each other. We are a body ministry. So it's in verse number six, it says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister. Yes, I want to be a good minister. And every minister would want to be a very good minister of Jesus Christ. Nourished up with words of faith and of good doctrine. Two important factors of a good ministry is words of faith and of good doctrine. So this is going to be my title for all three services today, and we would just cover up a couple of things. Words of faith and good doctrines, both are important. Words of faith and good doctrine. Good doctrines builds your character. Words of faith advances you forward. Good doctrines establishes your character, and the words of faith would advance you forward. And it's always to see these two things in a, in a, in a life of a Christian so that they would always build their character, build themselves up to do the work of the ministry. We are all called in to the work of the ministry, not a pulpit ministry always, but we, are all, we all have a pulpit wherever we are. We are all witnesses of Christ. We've been filled by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power to be witnesses. You're supposed to be a witness wherever you are. We call, we, we call ourselves witnesses. We are ready witnesses of Christ wherever we are because the Holy Ghost has come in us. We didn't see him being raised up from the dead, but the Holy Ghost is the one who raised Jesus up from the dead. The Holy Ghost raised him up from the dead, so we believe that Christ has been risen and we are witnesses. Wherever we are, we are talking about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died and he rose again. He's not on the cross, he's not in the grave, but he's risen. And the spirit that has raised us, or the spirit that has raised Christ Jesus up, has also raised us up and made us sit together with him in heavenly places. We are seated together with him in heavenly places. He wanted us to be there, seated. And uh, he's expecting all his enemies to be brought under his foot. So every one of us, we are walking this walk to bring everything under subjection. He's waiting. He's seated. He's waiting for this thing to happen. Go with me to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Okay? And Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 10 onwards. Okay? We read. By the which we will, by the which will we uh, are sanctified through the offering of the body uh, of Jesus Christ once and for all. We are once and for all. He was offered. He is off. We are, we, are, we are sanctified through the offering. We are sanctified, set apart, set apart. We are being called. We are being set apart. Made righteous, made holy, set apart. We are are a a set apart people. So when people look at you differently, it's no strange. When people look at you and say, why don't you do the things that we do? Why don't you speak the language we speak? Why don't you be around where we are? Well, we can be around where they are as long as we have our boundaries right. 
understand we have built ourselves in, the, in, in our character, in our walk with the Lord. We can be wherever we want, but we know where our boundaries are. We understand because our boundaries are our character that we have built over the years. And every day of our life, we are building our character. We don't want to break down the walls and let the enemy take control of our lives and, and let us not be effective in what we do. We want to be effective wherever we are. We want to be effective. We want to do the will of God. So once and for all, it's no more. Christ is no longer going to come down for you or for me concerning sin. Verse number 11 says, And every priest stand a daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, they had to do the same thing which over and over again, which can never take away sins. Understand that clearly in the Old Testament, they couldn't do what Jesus did. Never take away. There was only a covering all the days. There was only a covering of sin. So you cannot have a, a sin consciousness in you. No more because you're set free because sin was eradicated altogether. Maybe we go a couple of verses above. Let's go to, the, uh, to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more uh, no more conscious uh, of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it was not possible, verse 4 says, it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Thank God Jesus Christ has taken away the sin. Thank God for Jesus so you cannot, have a, you cannot have a sin consciousness in you. You've got to have a sin consciousness in you all the time. That makes you live that life that Christ has called you to live. You've got to have that sin consciousness in you. I'm a son of God. I'm a bride of Christ. I'm cleansed. I'm purified. I'm sanctified. I'm made holy. I made a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things, look, behold, all things have been made new in my life. So I see myself differently. And when I see myself differently, I would begin to see the world differently. And I would walk with no sin consciousness in me. And if, I don't have, if I'm not sin consciousness, I'm going to be sin conscious. So I understand here, it, in verse number two it says, they should have. They should have no more consciousness of sin. But they had every year. It was the blood of bulls and goats that needs to be taken to the altar. Thank God. In verse number 11, once again, we go to verse number 11. Which can never take away sins. But Jesus took away our sin. Jesus has taken away and eradicated the sinful nature out of us and he has given us his divine nature. He has come into us and he has made himself one with us. So we got the nature of Christ. We got the nature of Christ. We are not in Adam no more. We are in Christ. Either we are in Adam. Some people, they think we have two natures. We probably are in Adam and we are in Christ. You cannot be, we cannot have two positions. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. You're in Christ or you're in Adam. In our, in our minds, we need to, we got to get these things sorted out. Our mind sometimes could be double-mindedness, which can cause us to have nothing from God because the Bible says he can have nothing from God if you're, if you're double-minded. So make yourself to understand that I'm no longer in Adam, I'm in Christ. There are many scriptures that talks about we are in Christ. So if you're in Christ, we're sons of God. Children of the Most High God, blessed ones, holy ones, called out of darkness into his marvelous light, into his kingdom. Oh, we are kingdom children. We are, we are kingdom. We are, we are called out of darkness into his kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says, we have been called out of darkness into, his, into the kingdom of, our, of his dear son. So it says, once again, going back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse number 11. The, the sacrifices which every priest made daily, ministering, uh, oftentimes, 
the same sacrifices which could have never taken away sins. Verse number 12 says, but this man, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Son of God, this man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with all respect, we say, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, when somebody is seated, he has nothing more to do. Oh, Jesus, please come down concerning my sins and my sicknesses and concerning the trauma that I'm... No, no, he's seated. He's relaxing. He's seated. He said, I have done everything that needs to be done. When somebody is seated, he's in the resting place and he wants you to be at his rest. He wants you to be at his rest. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. It's talking about learning. It's talking about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not to get some information, but to have this revelation that you would know who you are in Christ Jesus and what I could do in Christ Jesus and how I could walk the walk of faith and enjoy life better, far greater than I was living. You know, the comparison made... Well, I'm now living a better life. When you say that you have not really experienced the love of God, you have never experienced the advancing power of God in you, when you say, I just have a better life, you still have not, you know, you don't have, the, you don't have a better life when you come to Christ. You have come, into, you have come into the newness of life. Not of the oldness of the letter, but of the newness of life in the spirit. Christ who lives in you, lives in you the hope of glory. You are different. You are different. There's nothing to be surprised when people say, you look different. And if you don't look, look different, then you, are, you may be belonging to one of them. No, you look different. You are totally all together. Now, you're, you're not some kind of a snobbish person. I don't want to fellowship. I don't want to. No, no, you are going to be around them, but you're going to be different. They're going to see you different. They're going to see you different. So we understand from this scripture in verse number 12, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12, this man once, this man after he has offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, is forever something that had happened, something that had been already sealed concerning your salvation is forever. It's forever. It's an everlasting. Anything that Christ has done for us, it's everlasting. It's not temporal. It's everlasting. It's forever and forever and forever. That's how we have got eternal life in us. That's why he says in the book of Jeremiah, he says, I've called you with an everlasting love. I love that word. I've drawn you with my everlasting love, with my everlasting kindness. Maybe I like to read that scripture. Hold on to this scripture. We come back to this. Jeremiah chapter number 32, okay, Jeremiah chapter number 31, I'm sorry, and verse number 3, Jeremiah 31 and verse number 3, the Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, yea, I have loved thee, I have loved thee. I'm not going to someday love you, but I have loved thee. Even in your, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us and he offered himself for us. We're different. We're different. The relationship and the fellowship and the love relationship that we have with Christ Jesus is, is, is different to all beliefs put together. You know, when they say, oh, I believe in the Jesus that you believe in, I say, no, you don't believe in the Jesus that I believe in. You, differ, you believe another Jesus that Paul talks about in the book of 2 Corinthians 11. No, I don't believe in the Jesus that they believe in. I believe in the Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the one who died for me and the one who rose again, the one who said, I am he, and there is none besides me. And I, I, I'm believing in somebody who is, who is a true and the living savior. He's Lord of my life. He's all in all for me. He fills everything. There is no vacuum in me no more. I'm, I'm full. I'm full of him. That's what we ought to believe in. 
right? Ye have appeared unto thee, and I'm say, I am saying, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, with an everlasting love, with an everlasting, everlasting, something that does not die. Our sin cannot die, his love. Us, our, 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 our failures, our falls, um, uh, uh, are we being, we, we mean, mean, uh, being away from him or trying to do something in the flesh and then we, oh God, I don't think you love me no more. He loves us. He's, he has called us with an everlasting love. It's an everlasting love which cannot, cannot be all. That's his nature. An everlasting love. Thank God for his everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, have I drawn thee? Have I drawn thee with loving kindness? Have I drawn thee? He has extended his love by drawing us with loving kindness. He draws us. We can never go away from him. As David said, I can make my bed in hell, but he's still going to be with me. He can still find me. But we got to wake and say, God, it's impossible for me to get lost. From you, Adam and Eve, they really thought that we have lost God and maybe God is so mad with us. He said, Adam, Adam, where are you? Well, be accountable. That's what he, told, he really meant. He said, I want, to, I want to come into you. Adam, Adam, where are you? When God calls someone twice, then he means something. Surely, surely, truly, truly, he says. He called Moses, Moses. And he called Abraham, Abraham. I, I, I know there's something, something great in that when he calls a person twice. And he, he said, you can never go far from me. You can never make your, make your way away from me so that I couldn't see you. And, Abraham, and Adam thought, oh my God, I have missed the mark and it's all over. But God sought after Abraham. And he made a covenant with, I'm sorry, he made a covenant with Adam. He sought after him. He said, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? See, that's, I mean, we can run away from him, but he cannot be, he, he will never turn his back on us. He loves us with an everlasting love. So whatever your condition may be today, whatever your state of condition may be today, it doesn't matter to him. He has made one offering. Jesus, the one offering, the perfect offering that he made for you and for me to make us free altogether. They're no longer we're no longer we're no long, we're no longer supposed to be walking in this condemnation. Condem I'm so condemned. I feel bad. I feel bad. You know, if you're condemned, you find your prayers. You're hindering your prayers to be answered. Let me take you to this scripture before we come back again to the book of Hebrews. Let me take you to one John chapter number three. One John chapter number three. You know, some of your prayers are not answered because you're walking in condemnation. While Christ, while you're in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? You're not supposed to be walking in condemnation. Okay, chapter number 3 and verse number 9. We'll read from verse number 19 onwards. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and, are, and, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Remember one thing, you, have, you may have missed the mark even this morning. He said, I still know your heart, right? You, he, he knows you better than you. God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. He knows all things. Nothing that you can hide from him. Nothing that you can say, oh, it's just a little gray area. I mean, it's a, it's a little white sin. It's a little, I mean, but he doesn't want you to get into a mess because he knows it's a little leaven that leaven of the whole lump. It's a little leaven that leaven of the whole lump. So why don't we get that little off from us? It is the little foxes that destroy the en en entire vineyard. The Song of Solomon's 2 and verse 15 says, it's, it's a little foxes that destroy the vineyard. It's a little things. You know, I, you know, we try to justify ourselves. Oh, they're little things. They're not small. They're, they're not so great. I'm not, I'm not like, no, we don't want to bring Phariseeism into the sonship that we have in Christ Jesus. I'm not as he is. I'm not so bad as they are. 
You don't compare yourself with the world, you compare with the Son of God. How about that? You always look to the Son and say, I'm, I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm not comparing myself with the world. I'm not comparing with somebody who is, who is in church, whom I saw last week, acting around and making a mess. I'm not, like, I'm not as she is or, or him. I'm a better person. No, we don't have any Phariseeism in, in the kingdom of God. It was never in the, in the even in the times of Moses, but it was, it was all built over the time between Moses and Jesus. Phariseeism. No, we're not. We are sons of God. We are honest before him. Let's be honest before him. Oh, Lord Jesus, I made a mess. Forgive me. Lord, I thank you. I don't want to. I don't want a moment of condemnation in my life. Because I don't want to let the devil control my life. I don't want him to come over me and accuse me. You know, he was the accuser of the brethren. He went before the father all the time because Adam, the, 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 the covenant that Adam had with God made the devil walk up to God's, even into his presence and accuse the brethren. But the Bible says when Jesus ascended on high, he, he, cast, he brought down principalities down and the accuser of the brethren is cast down in the book of Revelations. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. Where does he accuse? He's accusing your mind. Christ in you. And you're made in the perfect image of Jesus Christ. So he accuses you now. He cannot go to the presence of the Father. Jesus went up, cleaned up the utensils in, in heaven. And now he has no access to heaven. But he has access into your mind. We learned a lot about uh, 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 yesterday about the mind. Yesterday and yesterday about the mind. And the strongholds that the enemy can build in our minds. Brick upon brick, thought upon thought, he can build a stronghold. That's the reason we just have to, I mean the Bible says, give no place to the devil. Give no place to the devil. Don't have, don't have nothing to do with the devil. Give no place to the devil. No, 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 we don't want to give one inch. Not even a centimeter. No, we don't want, no, our, our minds are clear. We have the mind of Christ. We got the mind of Christ. I thank God, I thank God, I thank God, I thank God for the grace of God. For the love and the fellowship that we have with the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. I come boldly to the throne of grace with no condemnation in my heart in the time of need. I come boldly. I come boldly. I don't make an appointment with God. Can I meet you, Lord? No, He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16 says, come boldly, come boldly, talk to him boldly. He loves you. He enjoys your fellowship. You're the most important person. Having trillions of angels around him, he says, no, you matter much to me. That's why the Bible says when one sinner repents, all heaven rejoices. And the angels know the heart of God. They say, my, we got to rejoice. This is the time to rejoice. Because the Father is so pleased. There is joy in heaven. Because there are many, many getting saved just like this. Every moment all over the world. So joy cannot be shut in heaven because there is great joy. One sinner repents. One sinner repents and comes to God and says, God, I give my heart to you, Lord. I, I believe in Jesus Christ who is the Son of God. And I believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I accept him as Lord. Come into my life. I'll receive him. That's great rejoicing in heaven. That's great rejoicing in heaven. All over the world today, people are getting saved. How can heaven, heaven be a silent place? There's so much of rejoicing in heaven. Thank God for his grace. So going back to 1 John chapter 3. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Which means, he says, okay, don't worry, I know all things. I know how you messed up this morning, how you got upset this morning, even by action or by your thought. He only not only sees your action, we see our actions and we repent, but he even sees our thoughts. He, he, he even sees our thoughts. He says, man sees the outside, but I see the heart. 
I mean, Samuel wanted to go up and anoint the prophet, and uh, Samuel made a mistake. He said, being a prophet of God, none of his words were falling to the ground, and this kind of a person, he made a mess. He walked into Jesse's home and said, I'm going to anoint the king, and God has called me to anoint the first king. And when he went, he saw, my, this is a guy. I should anoint. He said, no, 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 you, you have seen it wrong. You, have seen as men, you see as men see, but I don't see as men see. I see as God sees. Or he says, I see different. I don't see as men see. You've got to understand that God sees differently. He sees our hearts. He doesn't appoint us just because we, we are so capable in the outside. We are so, I mean, I mean, to, in the presence of people, we look so nice, but he doesn't see sees your heart, your motives, your attitudes. He loves. That's why he said, David is, man after, David is a man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible records over and over again. He was a man after God. Oh, he messed up. He murdered, he lied, he schemed. He messed up, but God still called him a man after God's own heart. He's a man after God's own heart. And that's how we need to understand ourselves. We thank God for the grace. It's not by works. David said, I mean, blessed is a man who is not, made ju- who is not justified by his works, but blessed is a man who is, who is justified even by his grace in his love. I mean, those are the people who, whom God looks to and says, yeah, I can make something out of him. I can make something out of him. Going to verse number 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us, then we have, uh, if our heart condemn us not, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. What is confidence? Faith. Having confidence. You cannot have confidence if you have condemnation. They don't go together. You cannot. I'm condemned. Oh, I feel condemned for all what happened yesterday. Yesterday is gone, but today is new. His mercies are new every morning. Have you noticed that? His mercies are new. It was wasted yesterday, but today it's new. He sees you new today. He sees his mercies are new every morning. And his compassions fail not. Lamentations tell us. His compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Let's use his mercies. Lord, I thank you for your mercies. I thank you for your mercies. I thank you for your mercies. Oh, thank you for the new mercies I have. I couldn't live today if I don't, if I try to live, try to live like yesterday. My condemnation, my thoughts yesterday. I made a mess yesterday. I made a mistake. And well, you, you have. That's okay. Now that's okay in the sense. If there is a place of repentance, a change of attitude first. The word repentance simply means to change your mind first, and then your actions would line up. If you don't, don't change, things need to change inside out, not outside in. We need to start changing inside out. You know, when you look at somebody, you, you, see, you seem to feel this guy has really messed up. I know how messed up he is. Give it some time. He makes a change in his heart, and, he, and if there's a change of heart, eventually you will see his actions change in a while. But if he, does, if he just tries to change the action for a while, okay, I'll, I'll do it your way, okay, just, just for, in your presence, but that doesn't work. Husbands and wives, husbands and wives, when you see your husband make a mess, oh, don't keep nagging on him. He's changing. He's changing. He's quiet. Them. I mean, I'm a man. I don't, I'm more quiet. I do my changing inside more than outside. Let my fruits be seen. In a while, let my fruits be seen. And don't talk about yesterday's fruit that was bitter. Yesterday is gone, but today is new. Hang on to the word of God and say, thank you, Lord, for changing my man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my man. Oh, you're giving me a man, Lord. You're giving me a husband, Lord. A strong man, a good man, a loving man. As Christ loves the church, he loves me. I don't to pray some scriptures over him. It's good for you to pray some scriptures over him. Because the word of God shall never return unto him void. And when you take his word and speak over 
a situation over your life, it's his word that you're praying and his words can never return unto him void. And in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12 it says, if you have seen my word, that's right. I hasten to perform my word. I hasten to accomplish my word. If you have seen it right, you got a revelation of the word, you got it right, I'll do it. I'll do it. You got to get my word. Because he always confirms his word with signs following. He's always not, not, not following the signs, but follow, we start following his word, doing his word, following his word, doing his word, following his word, and he would start acting. Mark 16 and verse 20 says, the Bible says, according to, they, they, and the Lord working with them, Confirming the word. That's all, it also means in our homes, in our workplaces, in our, in our day-to-day living. He confirms his word. Something that we got to do first and then he follows. He says the Lord working with them. Confirming his word with signs. God will bring forth the signs. That's his work. God does the increase I always say, I always, I always say let's, let's do the quality right. That's our part. And God will do the increasing part. The quantity part is his. It's always we come into a position where we think of the quality. Let's, let's think of the quality. We'll do, we'll do things in, in, in excellence in life. Shoot for excellence at least you go somewhere higher than where you are. Shoot for excellence, look for excellence always. And you will go somewhere. And when you come to that place, you would still seek for excellence. And you will reach your destination somewhere down the line. Right? So we, what we need to do is to concentrate on the quality and he would do the quantity part of it. Let's do it in quality. When we bring our tithes and our offerings unto the Lord, let's do it in quality. Let's do it with a, with a heart of gratitude. We'll say, yes, Lord, I love you so much. So I thank you, Lord, for saving me. You know the prayer in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, and how they brought the tithes from verse number one onwards to verse number 15. When, when we come to verse 15, we say, now, Lord, I have done the right thing, Lord. I have worshipped you. I have rejoiced before you. I have brought my tithes and offerings unto you and have, and have, I have come before you. The first thing that we got to say, come before the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. You saved me, Lord. I was, I was a sinner. I was a nobody, Lord. But you made, it's a privilege for me to be a tither. You have made me to be a, I come before the king with the best gift that I have. The kings love gifts. You come to the king with the best gift that you have. And he, 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 he's pleased. And then he, he just opens up his windows of heavens. That's a promise that he gave us. He opens up the windows of heavens. And wherever you go, I always pray the prayer. I say, Lord, I thank you for these dear ones who are staying under the open heavens. Wherever they go in their marketplaces, in their homes, in wherever their needs are. Where notes, where notes and coins cannot take them, Lord, your favor will take them. I have been to places where notes and coins I've never been able to, uh, uh, to pay enough, but favor, divine favor, just a door open for me. I, I, I didn't have to use my notes and coins, it's divine favor. I said, Lord, I thank you. That's grace. That's God's goodness. That's God. Let's do things in quality and he would do the quantity part of it. Let's do it in quality, okay? So if your heart condemns you, if your heart condemns, verse 21 says, Beloved, it's talking to the family members of God. If our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence. Or we, have, we are, we are in, in the operation of faith toward God. And then it says, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's not work-based. It's, it's, it's not the Marik, uh, 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 
um, who is this? Mary and Martha. Martha kind, where you got so works involved, is obeying his commandments, doing what he wants you to do rightly. When you do it rightly, he says, whatsoever things you desire, whatsoever thing, you know, when I read that scripture, I said, Lord, I have a lot of desire. When I came to the Lord, I had a lot of desires in me. I gave my heart to the Lord very early in my life. I was about drunk very early in my life. And when I sought at him and I found the scripture, and I said, Lord, you'll give the desires of my heart. And then when I went to the book of Psalms 37 and verse number 4, where it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I said, Lord, I'm going to just hang on to this scripture for years. I hung on to that scripture. And I, began, I started seeing that God started changing something within me. And I understood that word. One of the words that I understood, be pliable in his sight. Delight yourself. Be pliable in the presence of the Lord. Always be pliable. If you have a plier that's rusted, I mean, you just want to get things. I mean, what, you, your, what your two fingers could do, you just got to, uh, uh, can't get this plier to work. But you get pliable. I know you, can, you always have ways of means of trying to get this plier, plier to work. But God says, you just obey me. Do things in the right way. And I will honor you. And I started seeing my desires started changing. I started seeing new desires coming into me. And then I understood the scriptures right. I mean, I could just put the, pick that scripture out and say, oh God, now give me all the selfish desires that I have. Oh Lord, I love that woman, Lord. Just give her to me. She's married. Nobody's all right, Lord, but I love her. <laughs> That's not the way God answers prayer. I'll just lay my hands on this car and say, oh God, you give me the desire. Talk to him, Lord, that he'll give me his car. No. Talk to the Lord. He has many more cars to give you. Talk to the Lord. You're talking to the wrong source. As much as God blessed him, he's no respecter of persons. Acts 10 and verse 34 says, God is no respecter of persons. If we only seek him in righteousness, he loves all nations. He loves all nations. I mean, every one of us can have desires in our hearts and every one of us can have needs in our hearts, but let's do things in quality. And God is a good giver. He returns back. So we just look to him and come to him and honor him and praise him. Okay, I'm just, let's go to the book of First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. I told you I'm going to talk about words of faith. And I'm going to couple them up with even uh, uh, good doctrines. Okay. So in our church, we do both. I do a lot of character building teachings, and I teach the people how they could honor the Lord, give him everything that you have, give, do the best for him. Don't do the least. Give him the best. Okay, Second, First Chronicles chapter 29. When they brought their offerings to the Lord... To building of the building of the temple in verse number six. Then the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captain of the thousands and of the hundreds with the rulers of the kings of the work offered willingly, willingly, spontaneously, presenting them spontaneously, voluntarily, they brought in, they offered freely. There was no compulsion. There was no pressure. They didn't do it because somebody said it. They didn't do it because everybody is doing it. They, had a, they, they built their willingness. It's a character. It's a character. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and if you're obedient. If you're willing and if you're obedient. If you're willing, it's a character. You shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and if you're obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. There's good in this land. There's good in every land where children of God are. Don't call this land bad. Call this land blessed. 
I'm in the promised land. I have giants to overcome, no problem. I have giants, but I have faith in me to overcome those giants. This is a good land. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I have a lot of good in this land. You have a lot of good in this land. And people run away from Sri Lanka. They say, oh, it's a bad land. Politicians are bad. Everywhere it's the same. But I say, this is my land. Christ has kept me here. This is my promised land. I shall eat the good of the land. As long as God wants me to be wherever he wants me to be, that's my promised land. See, when your focus is wrong, when you're double-minded, you suffer. You suffer. You have to face the consequences. You, got to, you, you, really, you really are troubled because you are double-mindedness. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. It says in James chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. Let that man think that he shall not receive anything from the Lord. I'm double-minded. This land is bad. I'm thinking of migrating. Well, if the Lord has spoken to you, do it. But if the Lord has not spoken to you, don't. Because there is good in this land. There is good in this land. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And the next verse... It says, let that, let the brother, oh, the verse above that, go to seven. Let's go to seven. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. It's talking about an unstable person. An unstable person. Okay? So we're talking about God who is building our character and he's want, he wanting us to advance forward by faith. Our faith is that which inherits the promises of God. Hebrews 6 and verse 11 says, it very clearly says, follow them that have through faith. Be not slothful, but follow them. You know, some of our, I mean, these are all lame excuses that we give because of our slothfulness. Let's put Hebrews 6 and verse 11. Or, yeah, or verse 12. Is that right? Hebrews, verse 12, I'm sorry. Hebrews 6 and verse number 12, that you be not slothful. You be not slothful. Some people are slothful, dull. Sometimes stupidity keeps us in, in one position. That you be not slothful, but be followers of them, followers of them who through faith and patience, faith and patience, faith, they're good friends. Patience is your character and faith is that which advances you forward. Faith and patience. And you inherit the promise. Followers of them. I follow the Bible from the book of Genesis. I find people who are walking by faith, have walked by faith and have inherited the promises. I also see living witnesses who are, who are, who are accomplishing the purposes of God. Long-standing ministries, ministers who are inheriting the promises of God. I follow them. Why? Because I want to know how they want it. I don't want to be an Abel. I'm sorry, I don't want to be a Cain. Although Abel's name is still mentioned even after he was dead. I, want to, I, I don't want to be a Cain. I want to be, I want to be following people. I mean, Cain would have easily gone to Abel and said, Abel, you did it well. God respected your offering and God respected you. And I, Teach me. I want to know how you did it. And I, let's do it together and God can respect my offering and, offer, and respect me also. I like to be, I like to be a follower. Good to be a follower because you could, you could see some people who have inherited the promises. I've seen your leader who has followed some who have been inheriting promises and I begin to see that I can follow his example. I can take his example. We've been learning for the past week. I've been learning and I, I was so, t and we could, we could see how they have inherited the promises of God. Right? So let's be followers. Quickly, I'm going to close and we'll have the team come up and just worship the Lord and lead us. And, and let me also 
drop this down into your heart. In Hebrews, once again, let's go to the book of Hebrews and, and, and uh, verse chapter 10, and we'll, I'll close there. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12. And verse number 12. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins and for forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting, from henceforth expecting, till his enemies be made his footstool. He is the head and we are the body. And where is the foot? In the body. And he's expecting us to tread upon serpents and scorpions and do those things that were impossible and start believing for things that you have never thought that you can ever do in your life. He wants his enemies to be brought under. His, he's seated. The head is seated wanting to see all our enemies brought under our feet. Sickness, you're going to be under our feet. You're going to be under our feet. In the book of Romans 16 and verse 20, it says, it says in a short while, you're going to see Satan under your feet. It's talking about people who are going through trials. and I mean, trials are real. Tribulations are real. But I would also, I wouldn't just stop there. In Psalm 34 and verse 19 says, and, uh, and, and Psalm 34 and verse 19, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but I don't want to stay there. That's what the devil is doing. But... The Lord delivered them out of them all. Amen. But we forget about the buts. We don't want to get that into. We just take one part of the scripture and we try to make a doctrine out. But we can't do that. Oh, I'm just afflicted. I'm sub- the, the devil is after me. I'm just troubled. I'm just troubled. I'm, but, but, turn around and say, Satan, you have no authority over my life. You're under my feet. The head is expecting me to bring you under my feet. Jesus already conquered the grave. He's waiting. He's expecting us. He's wanting us to. That's the reason he's building our character. He's wanting us to advance forward, build. Advance forward, build. Advance forward, build. Strengthen yourself. Okay, let's have the team up and let's worship the Lord. And I don't know how I'm going to risk you this. And uh, can somebody help me to take this around? Who is, okay, please, thanks. Just do it the way you just do it the way you want to, and let the Lord lead you. Who, who needs the right song to listen to? Praise the Lord. It's wonderful for us to be here and worship the Lord and, and build yourself up and strengthen yourself and don't give up. Fight the good fight of faith, holding forth unto eternal life, you got to hold on to some eternal promises that you have and fight the good fight of faith. Don't fight with the devil, you fight the good fight of faith. You'll be wasting a lot of time trying to fight the devil because Jesus already fought him on the cross and brought his power down to zero. You just need to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And he has given you all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 and verse 19 says, so let's walk before, go before him and praise him and honor him. And, and the Bible says there were, there were praises in the mouth of, of the babes and sucklings for the sake of the enemies to be brought down. Because of the enemies, the Bible says, because of the enemies, that we can bring forth praise out of our mouth. There's joy in the house of God. So let's worship him.